Hello and welcome to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today is uh, Sunday, the 4th of March 2018, evening already. And uh, it's been quite a busy day. I've been doing an hour long video in a German reading and six uh, little readings on the Daily Soul Bread that I upload on another channel. But still, this evening I wanted to come to the table to continue in the secret history of the Jesuits from Edmond Paris because we are nearing the closing of the reading of that book you'd think <laughs> um, because uh, we are dealing still with um, what's it called um, it says it here the infernal cycle of course in the chapter that is called the Gestapo and the company of Jesus but uh, after this, there will come something very interesting, and I'm going to tell that to you at the end of this video, because we only have four pages left to finish that chapter, and depending on how long it takes me to go through these four pages, I'll continue the next one, or I don't, and in that next one also I have another journey to go, and um, as we say in German, some other chickens to pluck. <laughs> anyway... Welcome to the 25th reading of The Secret History of the Jesuits, written by Edmund Paris, published in 1975. And uh, without any further ado, here we go. I'm gonna retreat uh, to the end of page 166 in the PDF, where you can see Hitler highlighted here in blue, uh, because we left off here on the top of this page, and I'm just gonna continue this last paragraph to get us back into the mood that we were speaking about. So the author says here in a quote from Frederick Hoffet, L'Imperialisme Protestant, and quote that says, Hitler, Goebbels, Himmler and most members of the party's old guard were Catholics. It was not by accident that because of its chief, chief's religion, the National Socialist government was the most Catholic Germany ever had. The National Socialist government was the most Catholic Germany ever had. So this means this was even more Catholic than the time when the Germans were most of the times the emperors of the quote-unquote Holy Roman Empire of German nation between 800 and 1800. Yeah. The National Socialist government was the most Catholic government Germany ever had. This kinship between National Socialism and Catholicism is most striking if we study closely the propaganda methods and the interior organization of the party. On that subject nothing is more instructive than Joseph Goebbels' work. He had been brought up in a Jesuit college and was a seminarist before devoting himself to literature and politics. Every page, every line of his writing recall the teaching of his master. So he stresses obedience, the contempt for truth. Some lies are as useful as bread, he proclaimed, by virtue of a moral relativism extracted from Ignatius of Loyola's writings. Hitler did not award the palm of Jesuitism to his chief of propaganda, though to the Gestapo chefs, as he told his favorites, quote, I can see Himmler as our Ignatius of Loyola. Himmler, the chief not of the Gestapo, but of the SS, the Schutzstaffel. Okay, let's just see if I have a picture of Goebbels here. I'm not sure, should have, of course. Here we have the German propaganda minister Goebbels at a speech and uh, we are continuing now on this page 168. To speak thus, the Führer must have had some good reasons. First of all, we notice that Kurt Heinrich Himmler, Reichsführer of the Schutzstaffel SS, of the Gestapo, which stands for Geheime Staatspolizei, and German police forces, so these were all combined, and he was the chief of them all, seemed to be the one most impregnated by clericalism amongst the Catholic members of Hitler's entourage. 
His father had been a director of a Catholic school in Munich, then tutor of Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria. His brother, a Benedictine monk, lived at the monastery of Maria Lach, one of the pan-German high places. He also had an uncle who had held the important position of canon court at the court uh, of canon at the court of Bavaria, the Jesuit Himmler. And I'm going to show you a picture of him directly. His name is Gebhard, and he was a confidant of um, Ledokowski. Means he was very close with the general superior of the Society of Jesus at that time, Halke von Ledokowski. This high Jesuit, Gebhard Himmler, was the uncle of Heinrich Himmler, the chief of the SS. And this is why we can be certain, absolutely certain, that everything was Jesuit controlled. The German author Walter Hagen gives also this discreet information. Quote, the Jesuits general, Count Halke von Ledukowski, was ready to organize on the common basis of anti-communism some collaboration between the German secret service and the Jesuit order. Unquote. As a result, within the SS Central Security Service, an organization was created and most of its main posts were held by Catholic priests wearing the black uniform of the SS. The Jesuit Father Himmler was one of its superior officers, and here we are talking about him. Gebhard Himmler, the one you don't know, not Heinrich Himmler, the one who is always in the spotlights. After the Third Reich's capitulation, the Jesuit Father Himmler was arrested and imprisoned at Nuremberg. His hearing by the International Tribunal would have apparently been most interesting. But, quote-unquote, Providence was keeping a watchful eye. Heinrich Himmler's uncle never appeared before that court. One morning, he was found dead in his cell, and the public never learned the cause of his death. Well, do I really have to tell you what happened? The Jesuits are the master of poisoning. The Jesuits are the master of killing, assassinating anybody who can maybe reveal too much. You know, the Jesuits have nothing against some of their doings being revealed. That is why people like Malachi Martin, who is a Jesuit himself, some people say he was a Jesuit, and I tell you the only way to not be a Jesuit anymore once you become a high-professed Jesuit, as Malachi Martin did, was when you, uh, when you are being brought out of the room feet first. Malachi Martin, in his book, among other books, The Keys of This Blood, revealed some secrets and inner doings of the Jesuit order. But you have to understand, as Tappi, Tappa Saucy told us in his book Rules of Evil, that when a Jesuit, and certainly a high-ranking Jesuit, writes a book, and especially a book about his order, he has the approval of the general of the society. So they are not telling you anything that they really do not want you to tell. This is also a very important point in that book that I'm reading for the moment with Brett uh, Norman, Code World Babylon. There are so many secrets in here, but a lot of these secrets are just told by other people, and like the Secreta Monita, the constitutions of the Jesuits, were made public during a trial, a public trial, so that's something they could not prevent to happen. But for the rest, the Jesuits give the information they want to give. And that is something that you have to understand. So, when we read here, as we just read, that Heinrich Himmler's uncle never appeared before that court, he was found dead in a cell, it is sure that they thought that when he had to appear before that court, he would have to answer questions they didn't want him to answer, and therefore he got killed, or killed himself. You know, a lot of the German high-ranking Nazis at that time had capsules with arsenic in, their, uh, in one of their tooth hidden. And they just bit on it when they wanted to kill themselves. Anyway, let's see if we have a picture of uh, 
the real Himmler, I call him. <laughs> you know, this one. Oh, let's take this picture. It's better. Heinrich Himmler and Martin Bormann in Quedlinburg. So, continue. We will not insult the memory of this cleric by supposing that he willingly ended his days against the solemn teaching laws of the Roman Church. No, he didn't need to, even though they are taught to do that. You have to understand, a Jesuit does everything a superior tells him, if it is for the good of the Church. Everything. There are no rules of no suicide. If the Church is the gainer in the end, you can even commit suicide. I mean, what did Captain Smith do when he uh, sank the Titanic? <laughs> he knew he wasn't getting out of there. <laughs> so, he committed suicide too. So I don't agree with this author when he says um, that we will not insult the memory of this cleric anyway. I insult the memory of this cleric as much as possible by exposing him as the Jesuit and therefore an enemy of God that he was by supposing he willingly ended his days even if he didn't do then he was poisoned. Anyway, the Jesuits took care that he didn't appear before that tribunal. Nevertheless, it says, his death was as, sudden, was as sudden and opportune as the one of another Jesuit sometime before, Father Stempfle, the unrecognized author of Mein Kampf. Strange coincidence indeed. Yes, you know, Father Stempfle was sent to a concentration camp, Dachau, and there he died in 1934. But let us come back to Kurt Heinrich Himmler, chief of the Gestapo. That's him here. Which meant he held in his hand the essential reins of power of the regime. Was it his personal merits which earned him such a high position? Did Hitler see in him a superior genius when he compared him to the creator of the Jesuit order? It is certainly not what the testimonies of those who knew him imply as they saw in him nothing more than mediocrity. And that's the point. Himmler was no more than mediocre. Yeah? But he was an actor. Like Einstein was an actor. Like Shakespeare was an actor. Like so many other people. Uh, Marx and Engels who were Jesuit trained but just acting. They weren't that smart. Himmler wasn't smart. Hitler wasn't smart. But they could be indoctrinated and they were good learners in the way that they said the things that they were indoctrinated. They could just repeat it. They could parrot everything. But actually they were mediocre. But they were possessed by demons. Because that's the working of Satan. That's how he works. Uh, that's in a way, of course not in the same way, but in, in a way God works too. But the Holy Spirit of God does not possess people, he does not take over people, but he inspires people to do something. The fallen angels of Lucifer, the fallen angels that came here with Satan on earth, those are possessing people and taking over. So. This is not the same, but I just want to give you an idea when you understand the working of the Holy Spirit through the through people, all through the ages. Yeah, all the people, for example, who wrote the Bible were inspired by the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit. These people that you see on the picture are also led by spirits, but not by the Holy Spirit, but by demons, and those can actually take care that these people do some deeds that you wouldn't expect from them because they are actually when it comes to the people themselves mediocre okay that's just the point that I want to make just have to check my camera here was that star shining with a borrowed brightness was it really Kurt Heinrich Himmler the ostensible chief who actually reigned over the Gestapo and the secret services who was sending millions of people deported for political reasons and Jews to their death? Was it the flat-faced nephew or the uncle, former canon at the court of Bavaria, one of von Ledokowski's favorites 
a Jesuit father and superior officer of the SS, Gebhard Himmler, who we spoke about. Who was it? Gebhard or Heinrich? This one or this one? Well, most of the times, and in this case it's the same, it's the guy in the back that you don't know. Himmler was the puppet they put in front, he was mediocre. Gebhard Himmler, his uncle, he was not mediocre. Let me assure you of that. It may seem reckless and even presumptuous to take such an indiscreet look behind the scenes of history. The play is performed on the stage, before the combined lights of the footlights, the stage lights and the arc lights. This is normal for any show, and the one who wants to see behind the props may well be regarded as troublesome and ill-bred. However, the spell-binding actors on whom the public's gaze is fixed have all come from behind the scenes. This is more than evident when we study these sacred monsters and realize that they are far from equal to the individuals they are supposed to represent. Such seems to have been the case of Himmler. But wouldn't it be right to say the same on the one whom he helped at his right-hand man, Hitler? When we saw Hitler gesticulating, gesticulating on the screens or, hard, or heard him bawling his hysterical speeches, did we not have the impression of looking at the movements of an automaton ill-adjusted with overstretched springs? Even his most simple and composed movements reminded us of a mechanical puppet. I just have to get a picture from Hitler into here that we can have the right picture during this reading here. Okay, let's see, what's this? Oh, okay. Uh, <coughs> Where's a good picture of Hitler here? Let's see. Let's take this one. Okay. So, continuing. Even his most simple and composed movements reminded us of a mechanical puppet. That's how he moved. And that's why I tell you that they were possessed and controlled. And what about his dull and glob uh, globular eyes, flabby nose, bloated physiognomy, whose vulgarity could not be disguised by that famous lock of hair and brush moustache which seemed glued under his nostrils. Was this snarler at public meetings really a chief? The real master of Germany, an authentic statesman whose genius was going to turn the world upside down? Or was he just a bad substitute for all that? A covering skin cleverly blown up and a phantom for the use of the masses, a rebel rouser? He himself admitted it when he said, I am only a clarion. M. François Poncet, the French ambassador to Berlin, confirms that Hitler worked very little, <coughs> was not a reader, and let his collaborators have their own way. Was not a reader, on another occasion I read, that Hitler only read newspapers. He didn't read books. His helpers gave the same impression of emptiness and unreality. The first one, Rudolf Hess, who flew to England in 1941, looked on his own trial at Nuremberg as a total stranger, and we never learned if he was completely insane or just a lunatic. The second one was the grotesque Göring, vain and obese, who wore the most spectacular comic opera uniforms, a glutton, a great robber of paintings and, to top it all, a morphine drug addict. The other main personalities of the party bore the same resemblance and, at the trials of Nuremberg, it was one of the journalists great surprises to have to report that, apart from their own particular defects, these Nazi heroes lacked in intellect, character and were more or less insignificant. 
doesn't let all what I just read here, everything that I just read here, doesn't all that just reflect what I told you about them just being actors, being puppets on the strings, being empty vessels to be filled by demons who actually did the work? Well, I think so. I think so. But, you know, that's my opinion. And that's what I'm gonna share with this reading with you, that that's my opinion. But I'm quite sure that that's the way it is. The only one who stood above that vulgar mob because of his astuteness and not of his moral worth was Franz von Papen, the Chamberlain of His Holiness, the man for every job who was bound to be acquitted. Who we see here in the picture. And um, a week or two ago I received his memoirs, An Alley for the Truth it's called in English, Der Wahrheit eine Gasse in German. I received that book in German, I'm gonna read that just for history study to see what that Knight of Malta has to write in his memoirs if there's maybe some interesting information that I can use in readings like this. If the Führer comes out as an extraordinary puppet, was the one he modeled himself upon more consistent? Let us recall the ridiculous exhibitions of that Caesar fit for a carnival, rolling his big black eyes that he wanted to flash under that strange <coughs> hat decorated with curtain tassels, and those photographs meant for propaganda taken from his feet and depicting only his jaws jutting out against the sky, the wonder man as an immovable rock, symbol of a will which knew no obstacles. What a will! From the confidences of some of his companions we get the picture of a man constantly undecided, this formidable man who was going to invade everything with elemental force, to use terms of Cardinal Ratti, which is the future Pope Pius XI, did not resist the advances made to him by the Jesuit Cardinal Gaspari, Secretary of State, on behalf of the Vatican. Let's get his picture back up here. Just a few secret meetings persuaded the revolutionists to enlist bag and baggage under the Holy Father standard to carve out the brilliant career we know so well and the well-known former minister Carlos Forza could write, quote, One day, when time will have attenuated the bitterness and hatred, it will be recognized, we hope, that the orgy of, blood, of bloody brutalities which turned Italy into a prison for twenty years and ruins through the 1940-1945 war found its origin in an almost unique historical case. The utter disproportion between the legend artificially created around the name and the real capacities of the poor devil who bore that name, a man who was not obstructed by culture. This perfect formula is applicable to Hitler as well as to Mussolini. Same disproportion between the legend and capacities, same lack of culture in those two mediocre adventurers with almost identical pasts. Their lightning careers can find an explanation only in their gift for haranguing the masses, a gift which brought them before the glare of publicity. Now, we have a picture, of course, of Mussolini too. So, let's just say, and here we have them both with their Maltese cross, wonderfully exposed, Mussolini on the left and Hitler on the right. Uh, or, the other way around, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> yeah, that's my left when I look at the screen. So, it's in the picture, he's on the right, that's Mussolini, and left, and that's Hitler. Okay? <coughs> so, Continuing the reading, this perfect formula is applicable to Hitler as well as Mussolini. Same disproportion between the legend and capacities, same lack of culture in those two mediocre adventurers with almost identical pasts, their lightning careers can find an explanation only in their gift for haranguing, haranguing the masses, a gift which brought them before the glare of publicity. That the legend was artificially created is evident enough when we know that today the Führer's retrospective apparition on the screens of Germany 
provokes nothing more than a huge laugh. But was not the obvious inferiority of these providential men the very reason for which they were chosen to be elevated to power? The fact is that the same lack of personal qualities can be found in all those the papacy elected to be its champions. Now, <laughs> think a little bit about American presidents. Think, for example, of George W. Bush, Jr. Think, for example, of Obama, who couldn't even say a straight sentence without his teleprompter. Think about Donald Trump, a person who only made it in the business world because he was pumped up with Rothschild and that is Vatican money, who is a Freemason and Jesuit trained and is only an, act, an actor, huh? an empty hose, I would even call him. And not only American presidents, but look at German chancellors, the same. Look at all these quote-unquote high-class politicians. I mean, Nicolas Sarkozy from France is a laughing figure every time I see him. Is that a charismatic leader? Not one of them. And neither was Hitler, neither was Mussolini, neither was Himmler, neither was Göring, neither was Goebbels. The fact is that the same lack of personal qualities can be found in all those the papacy elected to be its champions. Have a look throughout history, the last 20, 50, 100 years, who the papacy elected to be its champions, and then see if those people have qualities that you assume they have. Or are they just pretending to have those? In Italy and Germany there were some real statesmen, real chiefs, who were able to take the helm and govern without having to resort to this delirious mystic. But these were too bright intellectually and not sufficiently pliable. The Vatican, and especially the Black Pope from Lelokowski, could not have held them as a baton in his hand, according to the fiery formula, and made them serve his aims at all costs until catastrophe struck. We have seen how the revolutionist Mussolini was turned inside out, as one, who would, uh, as, as one would do with a glove, by the Holy See's and missionaries who promised him power. The unbending Hitler was to prove just as malleable. The Ledokowski's plan was, originally, to create a federation of the Catholic nations in Central and Eastern Europe, in which Bavaria and Austria, governed by the Jesuit disciple, would have had the pre-eminence. Bavaria had to be separated from the German Republic of Weimar and, as by chance, the agitator Hitler of Austrian origin was then a Bavarian separatist. But the chance to realize this federation and place a Habsburg at its head became more and more slim whilst Monsignor Pacelli, the nuncio who had left Munich for Berlin, became the more conscious of the German Republic's weakness because of the poor support the Allies gave it. The hope to get hold of Germany as a whole was then born at the Vatican and the plan was modified accordingly hegemony of protestant Prussia had to be prevented and as the Reich was to dominate Europe to avert the Germans federalism a Reich had to be reconstituted in which the Catholics would be masters. This was enough. Turning completely round with his brown shirts Hitler who had been until then a Bavarian separatist became overnight the inspired apostle of the Great Reich. Here we need to pause for a moment. We need to understand what information we have just been given. These last few sentences are probably the most important you have ever heard, ever lis uh, listened to, ever read, ever learned in your life 
concerning the German history and it also gives you an idea why they did with Germany what they did with Germany. The chance to realize this federation and place a Habsburg at its head became more and more slim whilst Pacelli became more conscious of the German Republic's weakness because of the poor support the Allies gave it. The hope to get hold of Germany as a whole was then born and the Vatican and the plan was modified accordingly. They wanted to destroy Protestant Prussia. They wanted to have a Roman Catholic Germany including Prussia but suppressing the Protestant powers of that state and by that turning all of Germany completely Catholic and therefore they had to break it up and that's what they did. And after the World War a part became the German Democratic Republic GDR and a border was fenced all through Germany from east to west and the west got indoctrinated with American lifestyle and the east got indoctrinated with Soviet lifestyle and that's how the world is today in Germany at least the West Germans think they are Germans, but they are actually the 51st state of America. And America is the second beast of Revelation 13. And they are just puppets without understanding. Now, the video has been only for half an hour, so I'm going to continue in the next chapter. But I want you to stand still a little bit on what I just read here. Turning completely around with his brown shirts, Hitler, who had been until then a Bavarian separatist, uh, to separate Bavaria together with Austria from Germany, became overnight the inspired apostle of the Great Reich. So all of a sudden, quote unquote all of a sudden, uh, it was all long planned, the Vatican changed its plans and instead of separating Bavaria and Austria from the Reich, they just took over the whole Reich and then destroyed it. Payback for reformation. Payback for the 1872 abolishment of the Jesuit order by Chancellor Bismarck. Okay. We have come to chapter 6. And this chapter 6 is called The Death Camps and Anti-Semitic Crusade. Let us just have a picture here of the reading of the book. This one. The Death Camps and the Anti-Semitic Crusade. Now this chapter goes on for a few pages. Let's just have a little look. One, two, three, four, five, five pages. So this is not such a long chapter, right? 171. And because it is not such a long chapter, that's not the reason, but the point what it is dealing with is that I want to read to you during this chapter, including then not in this reading but in another reading, I will include this book. Not the whole book, but a part of it. It was written by Uki Goni. It is uh, published in uh, 2000 and 2002, first published. It is called The Real Odessa, because you have this um, uh, novel, The Odessa Files, from this belletristic author, I don't know his name anymore, that was quite successful, although also the movie. 
And then Ukigoni wrote a book called The Real Odessa. And that book deals with how Peron brought the Nazi war criminals to Argentina. We will learn about the red lines. We will learn about how, with the help of the Vatican Red Cross and the Vatican monasteries and nunneries, German and Croatian, who we learned about in other readings, uh, war criminals were smuggled out of Europe and given new identities and new life in Argentina under the Peron regime. That's the book about. But chapter 3 of that book, the real Odessa, is called Undesirable Immigration. And I'm going to read to you, before we're going to continue in the discussion of the secret history of the Jesuits, the very first paragraph of that, first, uh, of that third chapter in The Real Odessa. On the 20th of January 1942, the chieftains of the Nazi killing machine met at number 56 and 58 Wannsee in Berlin to discuss the final solution of the Jewish question. For the benefit of those present, Reich Security Main Officer Chief Reinhard Heydrich reviewed the progress so far. SS Lieutenant Colonel Adolf Eichmann, head of the Office for Jewish Affairs, took notes. Gestapo Chief Heinrich Müller sat nearby. Heinrich said that he had been entrusted with the task of cleansing German territories of Jews. For this he had to a. make all necessary arrangements for an increased immigration of the Jews, b. direct the flow of immigration, and c. speed the immigration procedure in each individual case. Now, that's all I'm going to read for this moment. I'm going to start reading the chapter in The Secret History of the Jesuit, The Death Camps and Anti-Semitic Crusade, and then you will learn why I go into the book The Real Odessa. This is going to be some history as you have never experienced it before, I hope, at least. Now, the author continues in the book The Secret History of the Jesuits. To what extent the Catholics were masters of Nazi Germany soon became apparent, as also did the severity with which some of the papacy's high principles were applied. You remember that Franz von Papen said that the German Reich is the first world power to implement the papacy's high principles, right? The liberals and Jews had plenty of spare time to find out that these principles were far from outdated, as the most orthodox voices confirmed it. The right the Church arrogates herself to exterminate slowly and speedily those who are in the way was, quote, put into practice, unquote, at Auschwitz, Dachau, Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald and other death camps. The Gestapo of Himmler, Gestapo stands for Geheime Staatspolizei, Gestapo, and means Secret State Police. Yeah? The Gestapo of Himmler, our Ignatius of Loyola, as Hitler framed him, diligently performed these charitable deeds. What is so charitable about that? Civilian and military Germany had to submit Perinde a cadaver to this all-powerful organization. Means civilian and military Germany had to be as a corpse. Had to be as the stick in the hands of an old man who does with it as he pleases. The military and civilian Germany had to be as the axe had to be in the hands of the woodcutter. A mindless, willing tool. No need to say that the Vatican washed its hands of these horrors. When giving an audience to Dr. Neren F. Gunn, a Swiss journalist, 
who had been deported himself and who wondered why the Pope had not intervened, at least by providing some assistance to so many unfortunate people, his quote-unquote holiness, Antichrist Pope Pius XII had the effrontery to answer, quote, We knew that, for political reasons, violent persecutions were taking place in Germany, but we were never informed as to the inhuman character of the Nazi repression. Unquote. And that at the time when the speaker of Radio Vatican, the R.P. Mistian, was declaring that, quote, overwhelming documentary proof, unquote, concerning the cruelty of the Nazis had been received. Yeah. There are so many things that don't fit the picture. Let, if we only speak about Auschwitz, I could speak about Auschwitz for hours with you, but I would probably bore you with facts you don't want to know anyway. Auschwitz was a working camp in the first place. The biggest chemical plant in the world was in Auschwitz III. Yeah? You had three camps there, one, two and three. Auschwitz III was the biggest chemical plant in the world at that time. The Allies flew over Auschwitz in Poland since the beginning of the 1940s, taking pictures. They knew everything that was moving in there. There was only one train line, one tr uh, train wreck that was going into Auschwitz. It would have been easy to destroy that and by that stop the flow of people being deported to Auschwitz for whatever reason. But first and for all, Auschwitz III, the biggest chemical company plant in the world at that time, needed workers. Workers who didn't ask questions, workers who didn't need to be paid. Do your research in that. It's overwhelming what you can get. And here it says even so. At the time when the speaker of Radio Vatican was declaring that overwhelming documentary proof concerning the cruelty of the Nazis had been received. Without any doubt, the Holy Father was not informed either on what was going on in the Eustachy concentration camps, in spite of his own legate's presence in Zagreb. You remember Marconi, yeah? who was the nuncio in Zagreb, who was there, who was direct under the Pope's supervision, and then the Pope still says, I have no knowledge of anything that happened with the Eustachis in the NDH? Come on. Once, though, the Holy See was seen to take some interest in the fate of certain people condemned to deportation. There were 528 Protestant missionaries, survivors of all those who had been taken prisoners by the Japanese in the islands of the Pacific and interned in concentration camps in the Philippines. M. André Ribard, in his excellent book 1960 and the Secret of the Vatican, reveals the pontifical intervention on behalf of these unfortunates. The text appears under number 1591, dated Tokyo on the 6th of April 1943 in a report from the Department for Religious Affairs in Occupied Territories, and I quote the following extract. It expressed the wish of the Roman Church to see the Japanese pursue their politics and prevent certain religious propagators of error to regain a freedom to which they were not entitled. From the quote-unquote Christian point of view, this charitable step needs no comment. But is it not most significant, politically speaking? In Slovakia, as we know, Monsignor Tiso, the Jesuit Gauleiter, was also free to persecute the separated brethren, even though Germany, to which his state was a satellite, was mainly Protestant. 
it says a lot about the influence the Roman Catholic Church had in the Hitlerian Reich. We have also seen the part played in Croatia by the representatives of that church in the extermination of Orthodox believers. As for the anti-Jewish crusade, the Gestapo's masterpiece, it may seem superfluous to mention again the part played in it by Rome, as we have already related the exploits of Monsignor Tiso, the first provider of Auschwitz gas chambers and crematoria furnaces. We will just add a few characteristic documents to this dossier. First of all, here is a letter from M. Leon Berard, ambassador of the Vichy government to the Holy See. You know, Vichy was the um, France government at that time. Marshal Pétain, sir, and we learned about Marshal Pétain before, right? In your letter dated 7th of August 1941, you honored me in asking certain information touching the questions and difficulties which could arise from the Roman Catholic point of view out of the measures your government took concerning the Jews. I have the honor to answer that nothing has been said to me at the Vatican which could be interpreted as a criticism or disapproval of the laws or directive deeds in question." Unquote. The periodical Larch, when mentioning this letter in an article entitled The Silence of Pius XII, tells of a subsequent and complimentary report which M. Leon Berard sent to Vichy on the 2nd of September 1941. So we are speaking about the 7th of August 1941 and then we are speaking of the 2nd of September. So just uh, three weeks later he sends another letter that probably contains another information. Let's see, what do we read here? Is there a contradiction between the status of the Jews and the Catholic doctrine? Only one and Leon Berard respectfully points it out to the head of state. It resides in the fact that the law of the 2nd of June 1941 defines the Jews as a race. The Church, wrote Vichy's ambassador, never professed that the same rights should be given to all citizens. As someone in authority at the Vatican told me, you will not find yourselves in difficulties over the status of the Jews. Unquote. There is translated into practice the terrible encyclical letter mit brennender Sorge with burning concern against racism, widely referred to by apologists. But we find something even better in M. Leon Polyakov's book. Quote, the proposal of the Protestant Church in France that, together with the Roman Church, they should take some measures against the rounding up of Jews during the summer of 1942 was rejected by Catholic dignitaries. Unquote. Many Parisians still remember how the Jewish children were taken from their mothers and sent by special trains to the crematory furnaces of Auschwitz. These deportations of children are confirmed amongst several other official documents in a note of the SS Hauptsturmführer Danneke dated 21st of July 1942. So that's just two weeks before the letters that we just read. The awful callousness of the Roman Catholic Church and of its chief in particular inspired not long ago these revengeful lines from the aforementioned periodical Lack. Quote, Over five years, Nazism was the author of outrage, profanation, blasphemy and crime. Over five years it massacred six million Jews. Amongst these six million, 1.8 million were children. Who, yes, who said once, let the little children come unto me? And for what reason? Let them come unto me so I can butcher them? The militant Pope has been followed by a diplomatic Pope. From occupied Paris we go to Rome, occupied also by the Germans after the Italian collapse. Here is a message addressed to von Ribbentrop, Nazi Foreign Affairs Minister. 
quote, German Embassy at the Holy See, Rome, 28th of October, 1943. Even though urged on every side, the Pope has not expressed any demonstrative reprobation of the deportation of Jews from Rome. He can expect our enemies to reproach him in his attitude and see it exploited by the Protestants of Anglo-Saxon countries and their propaganda against Catholicism. When considering this delicate question, the endangerment of our relations with the German government was the deciding factor. Unquote. Signed Ernst von Weizsäcker. <laughs> now, this Ernst von Weizsäcker, I have to tell you a little bit of German history that you maybe don't want to know, but I tell you anyway, was a relative, and I can look it up which kind of a relative, if you want that, or you can look it up for yourself, of Richard von Weizsäcker. And Richard von Weizsäcker was the German president at the time of the unification between the East and GDR and the German Federal Republic of Germany, the Western Federal Republic of Germany in 1990. And during the time of the fall of the Wall of Berlin. Yeah? This Ernst von Weizsäcker is from the same family. When relating the career of this Baron von Weizsäcker, tried as a war criminal for having prepared extermination lists, Le Monde of the 27th of July 1947 wrote, quote, Perceiving a German defeat, he had himself appointed at the Vatican, taking this opportunity to work closely with the Gestapo. Geheime Staatspolizei, Polizei, Secret State Police. Unquote. For the benefit of our readers, not yet fully convinced, we will quote the following official German document which sets out the Vatican's depositions, dispositions and those of the Jesuits toward the Jews before the war. Quote, Studying the evolution of anti Semitism in the United States, we note with interest that the number of listeners to the radio broadcasts of Father Coughlin, a Jesuit, well known for his anti-Semitism, exceeds 20 million. The militant anti-Semitism of the Jesuits in the United States, as everywhere else, is not surprising on the part of these ultramontanes as it is in the perfect accord with the doctrine. Let us see what M. Daniel Robs of the French Academy has to say on the subject. This author specializes in pious literature and publishes only under the auspices of the imprimatur. We read in one of his best known works, Jesus and His Times, published in 1944 during the German occupation. Quote, over the centuries, wherever the Jewish race was, race was scattered, blood flowed, and always the call for murder uttered at Pilate's judgment hall drowned the cry of despair repeated a thousand times. The face of the persecuted Jewish nation fills history, but it cannot obliterate this other face, this other face smeared with blood and spittle, for which the Jewish crowd felt no pity. No doubt, Israel had no choice in the matter, and it had to kill its God after disowning him. And, as blood mysteriously calls for blood, Christian charity may have no choice either. Should not the divine will compensate with the horrors of the programs and uh, the unbearable horror, the crucifixion? How well said. Or to put it more bluntly, if millions of Jews had to go through the gas chambers and crematory furnaces of Auschwitz, Dachau and elsewhere, it was their just desert. This adversity was wanted by the divine will and Christian charity would err if turning towards them. The eminent professor M. Jules Isaac, president of the Amité judeo chrétien exclaimed when referring to this passage, quote, 
This terrible and blasphemous phrases provoke an unbearable horror themselves. Provoke an unbearable horror themselves. Aggravated the more by a note which says, quote, Amongst the Jews today, some of them try to shrug off this heavy responsibility. Honorable sentiments indeed, but we cannot go contrary to the evidence of history. The terrible weight of Jesus' death which Israel must bear is not up to man to reject." Unquote. M. Jules Isaac brings to our notice that the phrases in question have been altered by the publisher in the more recent editions of this edifying book, that is to say, after the liberation. There is a time for everything. The crematory furnaces were outdated. So, from the doctrinal affirmation of the papacy's high principles to their putting into practice by Himmler, our Ignatius of Loyola, the ring is closed, and we will add the half-mad anti-Semitism of the Führer thus loses much of its mystery. But going back to the subject, does it not also shed more light on that baffling individual? The things which were imagined before the war, in an attempt to explain the evident disproportion between the man and the part he had to play. There was a gap, an obvious vacuum felt by all. To fill this gap, legends were abounding, stories spread abroad not always without the secret purpose of misleading. Occult sciences, oriental magicians, astrologers inspired, so we were told, the sleepwalking hermit of Berchtesgaden and the choice of the swastika as the Nazi party's insignia, which originated from India, seemed to corroborate the idea. Maxime Morin refuted this particular assertion. Quote, Adolf Hitler had been a pupil of the school of Lambach and sang amongst the choir boys in the abbey bearing the same name. He discovered the swastika there as it was an heraldic sign of Father Hagen, the abbey's administrator. Unquote. The Führer's inspirations are also easily explained without having to resort to mysterious or exotic philosophies. If it is obvious that this, quote, son of the Catholic Church, unquote, as he was described by Franco, was submitted to the impulses of mysterious leaders, we know also that these had nothing to do with Oriental magic. The earthly hells, which devoured 25 million victims, bear another stamp, easily recognizable. The one of people who had to go through a lengthy and meticulous training, as prescribed in the spiritual exercises of the Jesuits. Well, I even finished this little chapter. I didn't think that I would do that within the hour. But that's no problem. Next reading I will not go into chapter 7, the Jesuits and the Colloquium Russicum, we will read that another time, but next time I will read to you chapter 3 of The Real Odessa, the book from Yuki Goni, which you can buy for a few bucks on the internet, Undesirable Immigration. And why am I doing that? Well, because we just read that Germany had in his own Reich, in Germany itself and outside of its Reich, like Auschwitz that was in Poland, concentration camps to kill off people who were not going along with the agenda of the Nazis and as we are told also kill many Jews. This real Odessa book with the undesirable immigration will tell us that Jews tried to flee from the persecution they experienced by the Germans during the Second World War, tried to flee into other countries, and those countries closed their borders. They did not take up the Jews. They did not help them. And the reason for me going to read this real Odessa part in this reading of the secrets, the secret history of the Jesuits, is most and for all to tell you that the Germans are the Ponzi's the Roman Catholic Church uses 
because as we learned in the chapter before and even before that it was the main goal of the Roman Catholic Church to extirpate Protestantism in Germany and to let Germany blood and pay for everything they'd done in the past. Germany did a lot of good for the Roman Catholic Church but most and for all they were always rebelling against the Roman Catholic Church in one way or another. And Protestantism cost the papacy dearly, dearly until today. That's why we have this movement of a one world religion and making everything one again as it was in the time before the Reformation when everything got split up more or less. And that's what we have to understand. So they picked out Germany to be the bad boy. But we are speaking in the real Odessa about how other countries closed their borders for the immigration, which we just spoke about in this last chapter that I read to you in the Secret History of the Jesuits. And then you will see that we were dealing from the beginning with a scheme that is meant to be all over the world. Every country had to play its role. It was not possible to fulfill the plans of the Roman Catholic Church who has been persecuting Jews since more than 2000 years already now when not everyone was playing along. And for everybody to play along well we're gonna read of that in The Real Odessa by Yuki Goni Undesirable Immigration Chapter 3 of that book 20 pages I hope that will only be one reading but I fear that will be more than one and that will be integrated in The Readings of the Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmund Paris and this was part 25 so next part 26 is actually reading that other book but in the light of the understanding what we just learned in reading the secret history of the Jesuits. For today I thank you very much for watching, listening, commenting. Please always do your own research. And until next time, Jörg from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth, says God bless you and bye bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he 
meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope. He said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.